It is Wednesday, December 20th, and this is The National. Tonight, CBC News has learned that Alberta has a serious RCMP shortage. We hear the concerns from the front line and from victims of crime. The holiday season means a battle for your dollars, but you may be surprised where Canadians are doing most of their shopping. But we begin in Ottawa with a blistering ethics report and a chastened prime minister. I should have taken precautions and cleared my family vacation and dealings with the Aga Khan in advance. I'm sorry I didn't. Justin Trudeau faced a hastily called media scrum this afternoon to say, as you heard there, that he made a mistake, and he's sorry. A scathing report by the ethics commissioner concluded that the prime minister violated multiple ethics rules when he vacationed on the Aga Khan's private island last year. So how could that not have occurred to you, with all due respect? You were going to take a free holiday from someone you consider a friend. How could it not have occurred to you that that might not have been okay? The fact is, we work. Uh, the uh, sorry, let me just try to reorder reorder the thoughts. We um, worked with uh, the the uh, uh, lobby conflict of interest commissioner uh, on a regular basis on a broad range of issues uh, when the issues come up. On this issue of a, a family vacation with a personal friend, um, it wasn't uh, considered that there would be an issue there. Uh, obviously, there obviously there was a mistake. To yourself, this is not obviously, maybe the best thing to do. You never Yaga thought Khan that. Yaga is uh, someone who has been a longtime friend uh, of my family's, a uh, friend of mine, a friend uh, to Canada as well. Uh, and for me to look for uh, a place to have a quiet vacation where I can have quality family time is uh, something we all look for with our families. After a year-long investigation, Ethics Commissioner Mary Dawson found the Prime Minister broke four rules by staying on the Aga Khan's private island in the Bahamas, by taking his private helicopter to get there, by holding private meetings about the Aga Khan's endowment fund, and by failing to protect himself from a potential conflict of interest. The Ethics Commissioner did say, though, that there was no evidence Trudeau discussed any House of Commons business with the Ismaili spiritual leader. But as Katie Simpson tells us, there was also a blunt assessment of Trudeau's ethics and his relationship with the Aga Khan. Justin Trudeau now becomes the first Prime Minister to break Canada's federal ethics laws. I take full responsibility for this. This was uh, a uh, family vacation that uh, I am responsible for, and uh, I take responsibility. The forced apology followed the Ethics Commissioner's damning findings that Trudeau violated the ethics code, which has been in place for a decade. The watchdog says the Caribbean trip could be seen as a way to influence the Prime Minister, since the Aga Khan is registered to lobby the government. Trudeau should have also asked permission before accepting that ride on the Aga Khan's private helicopter. We respect and uh, obviously accept uh, the full uh, report of the commissioner. Uh, we will make sure that moving forward we are uh, much more proactive about even uh, personal family vacations uh, with family friends. The investigation revealed this was the Trudeau family's third visit to the island since 2014. The Prime Minister's wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, organized two of the trips herself. I think it is a, a serious lapse in judgment for the Prime Minister not to realize that there was a conflict in the first place, to me, is a tremendous lack of judgment. Trudeau had argued he did nothing wrong because the Aga Khan is a longtime family friend and there are some friendship exceptions within the rules. But other than time the pair spent together at Pierre Trudeau's funeral, the commissioner said they had no personal contact over a 30-year period, that is, until Trudeau became leader of the Liberal Party. The opposition is frustrated that there is no punishment for Trudeau other than the embarrassment of being found guilty. The Ethics Commission does not have the power to do anything. There's actually no consequences to this finding. Merry Christmas. And even though he's walking away without any sanctions, it's not the way he'd hoped to start the holiday season. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. And no, it's not Thursday, but we've decided the ad issue panel is needed a day early to dive into the ethics watchdog's ruling against the Prime Minister. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Okay, I, how, how damaging is this, Chantal? Why don't, why don't you start? 
Actually, the report itself, when you read it, is more damaging than just the finding that uh, the prime minister broke some rules. Because when you you go through the sequence that uh, Mary Dawson has laid out, the ethics commissioner, what you see is that it took a fairly high amount of willful blindness on the part of the prime minister to make himself believe that he was breaking no rules by going on this vacation. Andrew. And he tried to make the same case to her, and she pretty much blew it out of the water, this business about, oh, it was just a good friend who he hadn't seen in 30 years except for once at his father's funeral. Uh, even friends don't necessarily give you large uh, gifts at the time that they're lobbying the government, uh, to need, having dealings with the government. Look, if this had been another minister in the cabinet, presumably he'd be, he or she would be out of their job right now. Uh, the prime minister broke the law in four different places, and that's just talking about the Conflict of Interest Act. I've seen people talking that, in fact, you could, you could argue there were criminal code provisions broken here. When you're, if you're taking gifts from people who are doing business with the government, that's serious business. So and, there are, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I think there are some liberal strategists who think they dodged the bullet by not having this happen while the House was sitting. I'd right. argue, one, that uh, the scrum the Prime Minister gave uh, and this embarrassing moment where he seemed at a loss to, for arguments to justify uh, his side of the story, uh, which, and the fact that it wasn't question period and the opposition asking for partisan reasons just before Christmas when people are going to be talking about stuff like yeah. that over yeah. turkey dinners is more devastating than a bad question period. Yeah, I, I mean, there are no penalties attached to it. So this is really about how Canadians perceive this. Is it not, Andrew? Well, yeah, but that's also a question is, and this has come up again and again, is our... Uh, ethics laws, our ability to hold people to account is noticeably weak in this country. Uh, why aren't there penalties attached to this? Why is it just that you get to, yeah, you have an embarrassing press conference where you look like a robot that's blown a circuit, but uh, there ought to be presumably more uh, stiffer consequences than this, and, and that should be one of the things that comes out of this. The other good thing that may come out of this, uh, if it is a good thing, is that if this report became the template for how uh, the ethics commissioner approaches his or her job, his job yes. in this case, since the, the next one is a he, uh, then we might have better rulings than we've had in the past. Yeah. Uh, this one took almost a year, four months uh, of that as part of the prime minister not being available for the initial interview. But still, when you read it, you're really presented with the facts that she was presented with. And you actually read this and think, this is you know, not at all the impression that the government or the prime minister tried to give. And that is something that I think politicians in the future may come to fear. So, so he, he said that he's going to be more proactive in the future. He's not going to take any holiday with family or friends without running it past. But <laughs> the ethics commissioner, what does this tell you about what might be happening in his office, inside PMO, about the kind of counsel he may or not be getting, about what he thinks about the decisions he's making? I don't know if you want to sort of speculate on that, Well, we, we've seen these kinds of blind spots before. Remember how unrepentant he was in the business of the private fundraisers with the Chinese billionaires? Yeah. Uh, we've seen this with, you know, the, the uh, in, you know, these repeated occurrences where they just don't seem to be plugged into how people are viewing this, uh, and and somebody is not actually in touch with the fabled middle class that they propose to represent. I don't put it on a staffer and the PMO that the prime minister would not recognize a conflict of interest that uh, a cub reporter would have seen about uh, his own job as a journalist. Uh, yeah. I, I can't believe that we would sit here and say, well, you know, someone didn't make the prime minister realize what looks obvious when you read this report. 30 seconds. Is it long-lasting damage? Because he does seem to be a little Teflon-y. Uh, so is it long-lasting damage, Andrew? Uh, we've discussed this before. I think that the damage is long-lasting, even if it isn't showing up yet in the top-line poll numbers. I think there is a growing impression of somebody who is... Uh, you know, the way certainly the opposition is trying to present him as being kind of entitled, uh, not quite playing by the same rules as everyone else. It's the drip drip of these things that, that add up to something, I think. Last word to Chantal. I think he's going to have to spend a lot of uh, downtime at Harrington Lake and not in some fancy resorts uh, if he doesn't want this to stick. Well, that ain't so bad. Thank you both. Appreciate you coming in on a Wednesday.
Chantal and Andrew will be back here tomorrow for their regular night, along with Althea Raj for our Thursday night at issue. And Ian, you heard Chantal mention Harrington Lake. That is indeed where the Prime Minister is going to spend his Christmas holidays, as well as in the Canadian Rockies. Meanwhile, you've got some news out of Alberta. Yeah, and it's a CBC News exclusive, uh, Rosemary. You know, often when we talk to police forces, especially the RCMP, we don't hear much about any problems they might have internally, and that makes these words from an RCMP corporal all the more remarkable. Things have just been progressively getting worse in my service. Investigations that used to take minutes now, now take hours. You have more work spread over fewer shoulders, and it, we're really starting to feel that uh, on the front lines right now. Yeah. James Smith works in rural Alberta, where the RCMP is the police force, and there he talks about calls to 911 on hold for more than an hour, officers overwhelmed, and as Rafi Bujikanian tells us, with Mounties undermanned, communities are at risk of being underserved. Cornelia Cameron is more used to homework after school, but found herself playing pet detective after thieves struck her family's ranch one afternoon. The horses, they were uh, nice enough to come running, even if they saw you show up in a vehicle, let alone with oats. She discovered bait on the ground, tire tracks leading to a pen, and six beloved horses stolen. At least one, Cameron thinks, is worth $50,000, but means much more to her. He's like a dog. He'll follow you around in the pasture. He's very sweet. The Cameron's ranch is an hour's drive from Pinoca in central Alberta. Authorities say it's hard hit by crime. We've heard citizens complain about the length of time that it takes the policing to uh, respond to a uh, break and enter. Now, RCMP documents obtained by CBC may suggest why. As recently as November, an internal website acknowledged problems recruiting in Alberta's dispatch centre. A lack of qualified bilingual candidates, vacancies filled with RCMP members from neighbouring provinces, sometimes officers pulled off the street to do phone work. This corporal says officers are in increasingly difficult spots due to lack of resources. For example, if we only have two members on and we're responding to a call of uh, an armed robbery at a convenience store, and at the same time uh, we have a, a call of a, a, a spousal violence, well, we have to start making some tough choices. And that's obviously going to impact the, the, the speed and quality of service we provide in the, uh, for those calls for service. How do you even make that call? That you, you wing it, yeah. RCMP management admits it's got 230 positions unfilled as of April. And we need to ensure that we can backfill those positions. But it's also important that one, we select the proper individuals, and two, that they have the training required. For the Camerons, a happy ending. After a call for help shared on social media, a good Samaritan spotted their horses roaming loose. I'm not sure that we'll find whoever stole them, but uh, right now I'm just happy that they're home. Happy, but still cautious. Until the police make an arrest, the Camerons will be keeping watch and the horses away from highway access. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Wetaskiwin County, Alberta. For a guy who admittedly doesn't really like to lose, Donald Trump and his administration were certainly savoring what's seen as their first real win after nearly a year in the White House. Republicans passed their $1.5 trillion tax overhaul today in the Senate. Paul Hunter now on the political risk and the potential reward. This is the sound of Donald Trump taking a multi-trillion dollar leap of faith. It's the largest, I always say the most massive, but it's the largest tax cut in the history of our country. Trump backers call it a win, a promise kept, or as Trump himself put it yet again today. We are making America great again. You haven't heard that, have you? The thinking is that tax cuts and other changes now passed by Congress will spur the U.S. economy, create jobs, and in turn spur the economy even more. As if on cue, telecom giant AT&T today citing the tax changes announced a billion dollars in new spending and $1,000 Christmas bonuses to more than 200,000 employees. The motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Still, despite Republican applause, 
Many economists say the so-called trickle-down effect has never worked, that Trump's tax breaks for the middle class are temporary, government services will be cut to pay for it, health premiums will go up, the rich will benefit most. 83% of the tax advantage goes to the top 1%. And they may be celebrating today, but I have the feeling that next November they will not be celebrating quite as much. And that's the gamble for Trump, betting that short-term cash in the pockets of voters will help them forgive other aspects of his presidency that have left Trump almost a year in at a record low approval rating, with next year's midterm elections getting ever closer. The other part of the bet, that it'll work and that the economy will skyrocket. It's always a lot of fun when you win. And Trump's defied the odds before. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The GOP and Donald Trump may have closed the deal on taxes, but legislative crunch time in Washington has only just begun. One key issue coming in hard and fast for lawmakers, the fate of the so-called dreamers. Donald Trump's political brand might be building that wall, but for many undocumented immigrants brought over the border as kids, the U.S. is the only home they can remember. Nearly 800,000 are, for now, protected from deportation by DACA, a program also known as the DREAM Act. Under Trump, the program ends by March and deportations could follow. Ellen Morrow has more on the holiday hopes and fears of America's dreamers. For Ingrid Vaca, there's both irony and inspiration in this route. Driving past monuments to America, on her way to stand up for the American dream. Dreamers are coming to town. This is her destination, a protest calling for Congress to protect the so-called dreamers. It's personal for Ingrid. Her sons are dreamers. How do you feel being here with people who are also fighting for this? We make to us very, feel very important because uh, they, when they come in here, they show the spirit they have. We wish for a dream at Christmas. Three months ago, the Trump administration said it would end the program that lets the dreamers stay in the United States. That triggered a six-month countdown for Congress to find a replacement or leave the dreamers vulnerable to deportation. Ingrid, like so many others, thought there'd be a solution by now. But all the dreamers have for Christmas is uncertainty. Back at home, that uncertainty can be too much to bear. I feel broken. I feel really broken. If they don't have any status, you know, they can do anything. Ingrid's sons were five and seven when they came here from Bolivia. I mean, you feel American. Yeah, basically. <laughs> and when people say you're not American? I just don't like agree with them or anything, you know, I, I feel how, how I feel. Because I grew up here, I came here when I was five, I don't remember anything from Bolivia. I feel American regardless whether they say I am or not. But with time running out, Diego is living in limbo. What do you say to people who say that you broke the rules and you came, you were undocumented, and, and so you shouldn't have special status. Everybody's an immigrant in this country. No one, you know, their, their ancestors are all immigrants. We're not trying to do anything bad to this country. We're just trying to make it better. I can see, obviously, how upset you are. But when I asked you if you have hope, you said that you still do have hope. My dream and my kids and all of the kids that I know, they have opportunity here. This is my hope. They have the opportunity to live in this country with, without fear. That's the dream for all the dreamers. And at this protest, their voices were joined by a handful of Democratic lawmakers. If anybody in the entire country can resolve to get Congress to do right, to protect American families, we can. Because you are a mother and you are fighting like your kids, right? That's right, I would, you would. And though there's no solution in sight, it's just what Ingrid needs to hear. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. Still ahead tonight on The National, after years of complaints and the threat of a class action lawsuit, the federal government is promising billions of dollars more for wounded veterans. But will it really be enough? Plus, tis the season for shopping online, right? But we have a number that may surprise you. 
And a little later, we'll hit the road with the new Constellations Tour, a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists traveling the country to bridge the cultural divide. If we can use this platform to, to move the needle a little bit for, for the non-Indigenous community, uh, that's exciting. The island is very small, a mile and a half long, a few hundred yards wide, approachable only by a small boat or a canoe. A large rock covered with scrub timber and salal lying off the southern tip of the Queen Charlotte Islands. And on the eastern side, protected by a promontory, stretching along the beach of a little bay, was the last large group of standing Haida totem poles, the remains of a deserted village, remembered as Nunstons, the name of the last chief, known for centuries to the Haidas as Squangwai, Red Cod Village. We came as guests, too, to honor the carvers in our own way, by taking what remained of their work to preserve it and show the outside world something of the wonder of the old days. The next day we approached the village with a different purpose. The wonder of the pole still was there, but now we turned to the job we had come to do, to cut them down and take them from this place where they'd stood so long. This huge beaver was left intact and standing after the fire had burned the house behind it and eaten through the pole just above its head. Its back had been burned thin and the wood was old and pulpy, a paper totem pole, Wilson called it. It was in a difficult position, so it had to be lowered onto its face. And a lot of careful planning and rigging went on before the few cuts needed to sever it from its base were made. It's hard to get used to the idea of handling a ton or two of wet, rotten wood as you would a piece of fine china, but it must be done that way till the sections are crated, and certainly works of art of this quality deserve no less. On The National Tonight, we can tell you that a Canadian woman was among the 12 people killed in that horrific tour bus accident in Mexico yesterday. 41-year-old Stephanie Horwood of Gatineau was vacationing with her husband and two young daughters. They suffered minor injuries. All of those killed were tourists except for a Mexican guide. Local officials blaming the accident on driver negligence. Witnesses say the bus suddenly veered off the road. I mean... People keep saying crash and stuff like that. The car didn't crash. It zigzagged and then it just flipped over and then it fell to one side and then it just flicked to the side of the road. Officials say when the driver lost control, he tried to get the bus back on the road, but instead it tipped and ended up in a ditch. In Ottawa today, that ethics report we told you about earlier was overshadowed by what the government was probably hoping would be a good news, big money announcement just before Christmas. A plan to reinstate the option of lifelong pensions for ill and injured veterans. We need to allow the individual who is living with a service-related illness or injury to determine the form of compensation that works best for them and their families. It's part of a major overhaul that the government says will give veterans another $3.6 billion altogether. That breaks down to a maximum benefit per person of up to $2,650 a month. The government will focus that money on the veterans facing the most difficulties. But as the CBC's Murray Brewster tells us, it's not clear whether all veterans will actually be better off under this new plan. A quiet, ordinary day for Aaron Bedard in Vancouver. His life has not always been so quiet nor ordinary. He was a combat engineer in Afghanistan in 2006, just when the heavy fighting kicked off. The war followed him home, where a different kind of battle was waiting. When I came home from Afghanistan, my mental health issues and traumatic brain injury made it very difficult to function. Thousands of other Canadian ex-soldiers were also struggling and fighting. 
they were fighting a bureaucracy that had taken away lifetime pensions for wounds and replaced them with lump sum payouts, dismantling a system that had stood since the First World War. For many Afghan veterans, it created financial uncertainty. I went through a bit of a nervous breakdown in 2013 and I almost lost my wife and my home and uh, had a really tough time. We will reinstate lifelong pensions and increase their value in line with the obligation we have made to those injured in the line of duty. The fine print of that 2015 Liberal campaign promise pledged to give ex-soldiers the option of a lifelong pension or a one-time lump sum. Today's bottom line for most veterans, would this overhaul put all troops back on the same footing? No. No, I cannot guarantee that. Each will be individually assessed. Any veteran receiving funding under the new Veterans Charter will not be receiving less. Bedard isn't the kind of veteran who will necessarily be affected by today's changes. They're aimed at the most severely injured, who make up only 12% of disabled veterans. They could end up equal or a little better off. For those with moderate injuries, like Bedard and the vast majority of ex-soldiers, it's unclear how they will fare. I feel betrayed because I helped uh, get this government elected. I helped them design their mandate. The changes don't take effect until April 2019. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Ahead tonight on The National, for decades, their Christmas lights brought joy to thousands. But tonight, they're bittersweet, as the neighborhood remembers the man behind it all. But first, we keep hearing how it's turning retail upside down, but how many of us are really shopping online? You always want to try things on before you buy them. You don't just want to buy it online and then, I mean, you can send it back, but who wants to do that? Like, <laughs> it's easier to just come in here, try it on, know you like it, and then buy it. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King. They are. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. <laughs> My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. One day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. And every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning 
my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring. From the crevacious slopes of California, but not only that, let freedom ring. From Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. You're looking at a live shot of downtown Vancouver. It's just past 6.30 Pacific time, and there are a lot of holiday shoppers out there. Some of the stores on Robson Street are open late, with only five days left until Christmas. Lots of people choosing to brave the crowds to finish their shopping. So why don't they just do that shopping from home? We hear so much about the growth of online shopping, but I think you'd be surprised at how little we Canadians buy online. So what's your guess on the percentage? Well, here's the number. Less than 5%. That's according to the most recent data from Stats Canada. And that doesn't include some categories primarily purchased in person, like vehicles and gas. So what's going on? People who study this say there are lots of reasons, from the cost of shipping in this country to a relatively small investment by many stores in their online operations. And some of the retailers we spoke to say there is a cultural difference between the United States and Canada when it comes to shopping. Many of us still love going to the mall. Oh, see, I don't know how I feel about these ones. It may be the busiest time of the year. Ooh, I like that one. But this mother and daughter shopping team aren't just at the mall together, they're loving it. It's the atmosphere that goes mm -hmm. with it. Sitting at home, you're always sitting at home. Coming out here, it's, I guess, maybe even a social thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah just wanting to get out, do something. Going to the mall is an easy way to do that. It's nice, yeah. yeah. Cindy Potier and her daughter Caitlin do shop online and so do lots of Canadians. But when you look at the total number of purchases in this country, the overwhelming majority is still done in person. According to Stats Canada, more than 95% of retail sales. Why is it that you like coming in store as opposed to online? That I can actually touch the clothes, I can try them on. Um, when I'm buying for someone else, it's a little trickier, but uh, yeah, I can actually feel it and feel the texture. Canadian stores like Roots are working hard to increase their online presence, but bricks and mortar, those old-fashioned stores, are still king. Is there something about Canadians that we, we just tend to love coming to the mall and going to the store? I think we love interacting with people um, and love interacting with products. So if you see someone that's walking around a store, typically they're going and they're touching a product. Canadians really want to sort of go out and experience a brand, have a lunch like in the mall here, as well as the fact that um, the mall properties in Canada really are investing in, in a better experience. Mountain Equipment Co-op may have a much different product line than Roots, but it has a very similar perspective. MEC has 5 million signed up members across Canada, and while online is important, the company says its growth is being powered by building new stores. I think people are essentially looking for the experience of being in the store. They're looking to touch and feel product. Uh, they want that instant gratification of being able to pull things away, but also they really want to talk to our staff and having that in-person experience and, and getting that expert opinion is really important to our customers. You might still be wondering how is the actual percentage of online purchases in Canada at this rate when so many people seem to be doing it? Well, for now at least it comes down to frequency. Consider a study our colleagues at Marketplace did last month. It found 87% of Canadians bought something online during the past year, but the vast majority, almost three quarters, bought no more than one item a month. All my Christmas presents online, all of them. Uh, ahead on the National, a new Cross Canada musical tour featuring Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists who are trying to build new bridges.
This whole thing is an experiment for us because this thing has not happened before in this way and because there's so much at stake bringing these communities together who aren't talking to each other, who aren't sharing the stage together, who aren't in the same room together. At this appliance superstore in Bellingham, Washington, there's a splash of color to this upcoming Black Friday. Not just the poinsettias, but an expected flood of Canadian dollars. There's a lot of money, I think. Yeah, yeah no yeah, yeah. kidding. <laughs> Kate Grady is a happy man. The Washington state housing market may be in recession, but luxury brands are big sellers at this store. If you were to look at our sales last year of high end versus this year, it's, I would say, tripled. And if you look at where those are going, it's all going up to Canada. That demand has literally changed the way this store looks. They've boosted the number of premium brands in these displays. What we had initially thought of bringing in was even a lower price point, but you know, we looked at our Canadian statistics and said, you know, these are what's selling. Why For Canadians, it's a perfect storm of proximity, parity and prices set by manufacturers. Most of your brands will have a, a minimum sale price, if you will, so they're going to say you're going to sell this appliance for X. In Canada, that X is traditionally higher than it is down here, so a Canadian coming down here on a package can save 20%. One package recently, it was a $10,000 savings. And it's not just the big ticket items. We get just a ton of Canadian clients. For hairspray? For hairspray. For and, and for this polish as for well. For polish and appliances are, are three items that we truly just fly off of our shelves. I mean, we definitely, those are probably like our number one sellers, is the OPI. These cosmetics cost $8.50 here. In Canada, they sell for $10 to $12. Even small purchases are making a big difference. Do you think it's helped stores like this during the American recession to be so close to Canada? Or what impact has it had? Yes, absolutely. I definitely think so. I think because you're still getting that um, demographic to come over the border and still shop with us. So even while maybe Americans are spending a little less, we're not seeing necessarily that the Canadians are spending less. They're getting ready for Black Friday at this sporting goods store too, stocking up on a brand that was developed in Canada, Sorrells. With Vancouver's population 10 times as big as Bellingham's, it's not surprising Canadian tastes would have an impact here. It's the reverse of the U.S. elephant looming over the Canadian mouse, although the store manager prefers a different analogy. The American economy is, is like a racehorse. It's either standing still or it's going too fast. The Canadian economy is uh, more like, and I say this with all due respect, it's more like that workhorse or plow horse that just keeps going and, and does well. And so whenever the Canadian economy is good, we get more business, and it has been stable up there. And so the biggest retail day in the U.S. will draw a lot of British Columbians. At the border just south of Vancouver, Black Friday is traditionally the busiest day of the year for Canadian cross-border shoppers. You will no doubt see pictures of department stores like this one opening at 4 a.m. to accommodate the rush. But some of the Canadians who are here on this day say you couldn't pay them to battle the crowds on Friday. You guys yeah. coming down? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Don't like the crowds. No, probably not. It, it would just mean it would be really crazy and I prefer it a little quieter. No, you're not going to get me to come down here for the worst shopping day of them all. It's yeah. supposed to be the best shopping day. Uh, <laughs> depends, depends what you're in for. If you're in for the, the bargains or the lineups. And hey, if he has a change of heart, there will be more bargains ahead. Ever mindful of the Canadian shopper, some stores here have added a sale that is not very familiar to many Americans. What the white artists have quickly discovered, uh, which has been a beautiful surprise all around, is, is the high level of talent. And I was like, that wasn't a surprise for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jason Collette and Jarrett Martineau, two of the driving forces behind a new experiment made up of outstanding musical talent from both Canada's Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities, trying to bring these two worlds together without judgment, recrimination, or opening old wounds. Just music and storytelling from one side of Canada to the other. Duncan McHugh takes us inside the new Constellations Tour. It's 9 a.m. when New Constellations pulls into Montreal. This is home away from home, where the accommodations 
are as tight as the rule. You gotta put your shoes in the bin. <laughs> shoes in the bin? Shoes in the bin. Oh, okay. Because we run a we run a tight clean ship over here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Nick. Nick, Duncan. They're a traveling caravan of musicians and authors. That's Damien. Visiting towns, cities, and First Nations across Canada. Yeah. Holy cow. So this is me. This is me. <laughs> so so there's even people down there. Yeah, people down on the bottom. This is cozy, man. It's cozy. Jarrett Martineau, a Cree Dene music producer, is one of the men behind the tour. The bottom one has a shelf. It's a really hard lifestyle. Yeah. Like, the other is indie musician Jason Collette from the band Broken Social. <laughs> The goal of their tour, to bring indigenous and non-indigenous artists together, to live and perform side by side. An attempt to bridge the gap between two worlds that rarely meet. This whole thing is an experiment for us because this thing has not happened before in this way and because there's so much at stake bringing these communities together who aren't talking to each other, who aren't sharing the stage together, who aren't in the same room together very often. Why is that rare? Because it's not happened before. And, and I'm a part of a, uh, I've become more aware of this as I've engaged in this project, like that, that my, my indie rock world is very white centric, you know? I've been pretty blind to that for the most part. It's, it's just what it's been. You know. What's it like to, to realize that your indie rock world is pretty white? It, in some ways, it's a little embarrassing, you know? Um, but, but at the same time, it, uh, I'm really valuing the steep learning curve of, of, of the perspectives that I'm gaining by working on this, for sure. Where's not Jason? Oh, very the white one. Through life. Yeah. No, I want to use Jason. That's it. No whitewashing to be found with new constellations. As they set up the venue and start sound check, the core lineup is joined by locals that include Lido Pimienta, fresh off winning the Polaris Prize. Hey, yeah. There's also indie rocker and hometown favorite Sam Roberts. Other big names have appeared too. Feist, Naomi Klein, A Tribe Called Red, over 50 performers in all. But the real goal is to shine a spotlight on new indigenous voices, such as Ansley Simpson and Leanne Simpson, whose music explores Anishinaabe connections to land and story. Indigenous musicians have been for so long unheard. Yeah. Why? Because these artists were living under a time where they couldn't be proud of who they were. They were living under a time of total racist reality. So presenting that as a part of your music wasn't something that would be socially acceptable in any context, let alone presenting yourself as an indigenous person in that reality wouldn't even be socially acceptable. Soft rock and their socks off. These days, indigenous music is experiencing a moment. Call it a resurgence, perhaps the next wave. Riding that wave, Jeremy Dutcher, who hails from Wollstock Nation in New Brunswick. This is his first rock tour. He hasn't even released his debut album yet. You know, I like to talk more about resurgence and revitalization, you know. Um, singing the language is really, really important to me. He's one of fewer than a thousand people in Canada who speak the Wollstock Maliseet language, and it's woven into his songs. We're just excited to tell our stories on our own terms. And I think for us, we invite people to listen. If we can use this platform to, to move the needle a little bit for, for the non-Indigenous community, uh, that's exciting.
Yeah. All right. Sound checks like this are old hat for Juno winning Inuk singer Elisipi, a mother of two with a new baby and new album on the way. I think for us as native artists or native people, I think we're out there now. We're, we're more than ever and we're, we're not, we have no, you know, it's, we have no limits. Um, because what we do is uh, we just want to expand it to not just native people, to, to others. Is you okay if we decide to do a Hanya Romani thing, we should definitely yeah. do it. Elisipi also sings in her indigenous language, in Nuktitut, and she tackles tough topics. This song, about domestic violence, is also about indigenous empowerment. There's one song that I wrote called Aknaq, and uh, it's, it's very much um, representing the woman now, today, who's able to express and say, I, I don't want this. Another of her songs, a cover of a long forgotten Inuit folk rock song, has become a group favorite. Part of the reason for the moment of a tour like this even being possible and a project like this being possible is the fact of the caliber of the talent in the indigenous community right now across the country is so, 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 so high. So why was it so important for non-indigenous artists and indigenous artists to be on the tour together? Why not just have a tour of indigenous artists? I think it becomes greater than the sum of its parts. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Well, uh, Having notable non-Indigenous artists involved uh, was a strategic thing on our part. If we have a band like July Talk or Sam Roberts showing up, that people are going to pay attention. What would you say to, to a concern that the white artists are, are propping up the Indigenous artists? It was a concern of ours from the get-go, you know. We didn't want this to have any kind of charity optic to it, you know, it's very important. But the thing is, is and what the, what, what the white artists have quickly discovered, uh, which has been a beautiful surprise all around, is, is the high level of talent. It's, it's, the, it's the furthest thing from charity. They can stand on their own really well. Yeah, and I was like, that wasn't a surprise for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sam Roberts seems anxious to avoid any white savior vibe. Instead, plans for a collaboration with Cree cellist Chris Dirksen. I'm definitely not trying to save anybody on this stage tonight. It's not the role. It's just to hear, I mean, and to share, and to get to know each other. It's like having cousins that you know you have, but you're never really allowed to meet for whatever reason. If New Constellations is a meeting of cousins, the circle just before the show is a chance for quality family time and to work out pre-show jitters. All right. All right. And then doors open and it begins. Greetings, hello everyone. Tansei. And uh, welcome all everyone to New Constellations. This tour cost north of a million dollars to gather all the performers plus hold workshops for Indigenous youth, much of it paid for by the Canada 150 Fund and the Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Thank you all for paying your taxes and supporting the arts. But the artists resist any grand notions that what they're achieving is reconciliation through art. I struggle with that word. And I think it's easy to frame things that way. 
What's more difficult is to actually engage with what's happening today. You know, talking about water rights, talking about housing, you know, talking about the suicide um, crisis in a lot of our communities. Um, these are the conversations I want to be having. We're not going to change anything like that, but we are hoping that a few hundreds of people, now thousands of people that we met through this tour who came, are probably going to go back home and maybe have a conversation, something they would have never done. Those conversations often stall when accusations of racism and privilege cause people to leave the room. But this audience stays to the end. The new Constellations finale, a huge 70s hit originally sung by an indigenous band that everyone can sing and dance to. In the afterglow, there's no talk of land disputes or white guilt. There are only relationships. Some have called new constellations groundbreaking. A more apt description may be ground healing. Duncan McHugh, CBC News, Montreal. That was cool. A little more about that song there. The artists were performing on stage at the end. Some of you may recognize it from the 70s, but some of you may recognize it from Guardians of the Galaxy. Come and Get Your Love was a huge hit back in 1974 for Redbone. That's the first ever chart-topping all Native American band. Uh, they were members of the Cherokee, Yaki, Yaki's, Apaches, and Shoshone heritage. And that might be a bit of a throwback for some of you. Very 70s in a good way. <laughs> As part of our year in coverage, uh, we are looking back at uh, some of the great pictures that were taken by CBC videographers and photographers. And here's one uh, that Mark Robichaux had. We're in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. I was kind of taken by surprise. Um, the Prime Minister was going to give the residential school uh, survivors from Newfoundland and Labrador uh, an apology. Toby was chosen to accept that apology. Toby turned the corner and it just, boom, it happened. No. Toby just completely uh, threw himself on the Prime Minister crying, and the Prime Minister cried with him. <laughs> Meeting the Prime Minister was a major deal for him. Thank you. I realized that these two men, who look completely different, are the same age. You can see what life has given them just by, just by their faces. He wanted someone to say, I'm sorry, and that's what happened. We're here together. Yep. A rapidly increasing number of experts and politicians are becoming progressively alarmed about air pollution. In the United States, it's estimated that 370,000 tons of pollution are dumped into the air every day. It's figured that the economic cost of the country of air pollution runs upward of $12 billion in property damage and in widespread illnesses and deaths to humans and to animals. Most of the damage is caused by car pollution coming from the exhaust, and a bill has just been introduced in the Congress for a federal study of electric cars. Congressman Richard Ottinger, a New York Democrat, dramatizes his proposal by driving an electric car to the Congress. He says wide use of electric cars would dramatically reduce air pollution. The car uses no gas or oil, needs almost no maintenance, and creates no pollution or noise. 
It runs on four silver zinc batteries linked together by a series of electric relays for driving power and a smaller battery for lights and horn. The congressman says you simply plug the car into an outlet wherever you park to recharge your batteries. This demonstration car sells for about $2,000 and uses only a little more current than an electric iron. Speed is a problem though, for the car can only get up to 40 or 50 miles an hour. One prominent meteorologist, Morris Nyberger of the University of California, predicts that if nothing is done about pollution, in the next 100 years from now, air pollution will be so bad that humans may not be able to survive. And even the comedians are worrying about it, as for instance Tom Lair, who says, the city streets today are quite a thrill. If the hoods don't get you, the monoxide will. Knowlton Nash, CBC News, Washington. Automobiles come in all shapes and sizes, and about the only thing they have in common is that most of them are powered by gasoline. But the days of gasoline guzzlers are numbered, and the future, some experts say, lies in powering cars with electricity. Over the weekend, the designers of this car met with city and federal officials about building the models here in Windsor. The company says it'll need help in financing the venture, but feels the market is ready for a luxury car powered by fast-charge lead-cobalt batteries. Windsor is only one of the production sites being considered, but Development and Commissioner Jim frankly, Moore feels we do have an edge. Uh, uh, one of the questions put to them, in fact, was, uh, are you another Bricklin? And uh, they recognized that uh, in order to have credibility with the car buying public, with the dealers, uh, even with governments, let's say, uh, if you're going to do something like build a totally new car. On the National Tonight, a development this hour on a story we brought you last night. Swastika Trail, a street in the town of Puss Lynch, Ontario, will keep that name. Councillors voting against renaming the street. That is despite pressure from some in the community. The street reportedly getting its name back in the 1920s when the swastika was still known as a symbol of well-being or good fortune. But as we know, it was later co-opted by the Nazis. Residents who wanted the street name gone said it was an unnecessary reminder of bigotry and hate. The examination and analysis phase is just starting and there is much work to be done. What we've learned so far is that the engines were operating up to the point of impact. That was an update from the Transportation Safety Board on last week's plane crash in northern Saskatchewan. It has ruled out engine failure as a cause, but is still looking at the issues of pilot experience, weather conditions, and the weight of cargo. All 25 people on board West Wind Aviation Flight 282 survived the crash. Also tonight, another decision from the U.S. Commerce Department against Canadian aircraft giant Bombardier. It upholds duties of almost 300% on the company's C-Series jet sales to the United States. Final word on this dispute is expected early next year from the U.S. International Trade Commission. Before we go tonight, a sad note from Burlington, Ontario. Doug Musson was locally famous for his spectacular Christmas displays. Doug passed away earlier this week after he fell off a ladder. And tonight the community is remembering the popular 82-year-old who had a heart of a great big kid. Originally from Calgary, Doug was locally known as Burlington's own Clark Griswold. You'll remember Chevy Chase from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Doug started more than 40 years ago and with every year it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. Though one can only shudder at the hydro bills he must have weathered over the years. What with a fire-breathing dragon, a giant moose complete with a swiveling head. That illuminated motorcycle he built in 1998, that was to honor his son who died in a crash. This year's display was typically amazing, though it could well be the last one. Do you like coming here every year? Yeah. What do you like about it? Um, that it's one of me and my dad's traditions. That's so nice. I, it, I do wonder whether the family will carry on or just leave it up year-round. That's the other option. I love watching Christmas lights. I'm really <laughs> lazy about putting them up, so I'm back home in Vancouver, as you know, and, and on yes. Saturday went to the mall and bought the, like the, the one laser light, you know, that does it all for you, but I haven't Perfect. set it up yet. Well, that's pretty lame. You've got to get on that. <laughs>
<laughs> just a few days left. That is the national for December the 20th. Good night. Good night.